Okay, uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, year's new Russia conference dedicated to the topic Great Powers and Arctic Politics. The new Russia conference has become a key venue for gathering academics and policy experts to reflect on issues related to Russia. This year also marks the 25 years anniversary of the new Russia conference, so that's quite an achievement. And uh, this is the first year we have a fully digital version. And we're very happy to see that close to 900, 900 people have registered so far. So coming from all corners of the world. So please uh, feel uh, welcome. And we are very much happy to have you here. Let me thank the organizers, the panelists, and of course, most of all, all you as an audience for joining in. We want this conference to be interactive, so you are welcome to send in questions in the chat function. Feel free to send a question at any time. So there's no reason to wait, just start posting your question. Now, the topic of this year's conference is the great powers and Arctic politics. At NUPI, we have just completed a research project uh, with the very same topic and title. Our researchers have examined how the perspectives on the Arctic has evolved and changed in Russia, in the US, in China, as well as among European countries. Throughout the next few hours, we will have a series of panels with leading experts going more into the depth, into the Arctic politics and policies of Russia, of China and the US. I will leave it to the experts to summarize the findings of the research project, but let me just mention some takeaway points. A first observation is that the Arctic is a delicate mix of both competition and cooperation. During the last decade or so, the Arctic has become more about security, but there's also more diplomacy and more science cooperation. A second observation is that it seems that the great powers have an interest in a peaceful Arctic, although they might have different views on how to achieve that. Two, two key challenges arise. The first is whether the great powers and the other Arctic countries can successfully manage the transition caused by the changing nature of the Arctic. Key drivers are, of course, climate change, the melting of the ice cap, and the corresponding changes in communication, in connectivity, and also the potential for exploitation of resources. A second challenge relates to the extent in which the great powers and other Arctic countries can successfully prevent tensions elsewhere in global affairs from spilling over to or influencing the Arctic. And then, of course, we can add a third challenge. In dealing with both of these two first challenges, we also have to ensure that we can manage the risks caused by accidents, miscommunications and miscalculations. So now to start off this conference, we are fortunate enough to uh, be joined by the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Ine Eriksen Sørede. Welcome and thank you so much for accepting the invitation. So Foreign Minister, how do you view the great power dynamics in the Arctic? Well, first of all, I have to say thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, and of course, especially this year when uh, we have the 25th anniversary and we have so many people gathered around the world to, to see this. And uh, it is also a very, very timely topic because I think both you and I have discussed uh, in many panels and, and over a length of time, the fact that the Arctic remains a very, I would say, stable area where all the uh, all the countries and all who are interested in the Arctic abide by international law and regulations and also keeping the area low tension. But of course, it would be, um, I, I would not shy away from the fact that, as you mentioned uh, in your introduction, times are changing, which means that when we see the great power rivalry uh, arising and, and also being a more prominent part of, of many discussions in the world, it can also potentially affect the Arctic if the stakeholders are not continuing to make such an effort to keep it a low tension area. And, and I've said also repeatedly that the fact that this is a low tension area that is largely characterized by, by good cooperation 
is not a coincidence. I mean, we have spent a lot of political resources on making this happen, and we want to, to continue to have it that way. At the same time, we cannot shy away from the fact that we see a Russian military buildup, which we do not think is directed towards Norway, but we see that it's a potentially strategic challenge to NATO. And we also see greater interest from actors from the outside, like China uh, and, and others. So, as you say, it's a, it's a mixed picture, but largely we, uh, we see that the, um, the, the more or less uh, dominant features still uh, are uh, low tension, good cooperation and also people to people contact. Mm. Okay, you said the times are changing. Uh, what are the implications of this for or maybe the increased geopolitical tensions for Norway and for the Norwegian foreign policy, as you said. So what are the specific kind of policy changes that you are thinking about, pondering about, planning for? Well, um, first of all, I think it's uh, it will be interesting to, to hear the rest of the conference where you also touch upon uh, China and Russia in this picture. Um, and I think it is extremely important that uh, we are able to see kind of the whole picture and the whole mix. And the reason I mention that is because it's not without interest what the relations between China uh, and Russia is in the Arctic and what kind of motives they have, if they perceive each other as uh, strategic rivals or if they perceive each other as strategic um, and a strategic alliance. Um, and what are the motives behind an eventual cooperation? Is it strong? Is it deep? Is it wide? Uh, all of this also has implications for us and, and also for NATO. So what we are looking into is, of course, um, the very the very fixed feature of Norwegian foreign policy and security policy is our NATO membership. But also our neighborship with Russia is a very defining factor. So everything that takes place uh, in the high north, be it of security policy character, be it of people to people contact or joint um, management of, of fisheries resources, or resources, which is a very prominent feature of our cooperation with Russia, we have to see whether or not this uh, this has implications. Um, just one example, uh, of course, is that when we look at um, China and Russia and their activity uh, in in the Arctic, Russia is still the major player of the two, uh, and they have, I would say, very different um, motives behind their engagement from uh, from China's side. Uh, this is, of course, also a desire to not have a strong U.S. presence uh, in the Arctic, but uh, the Arctic is a U.S. And the, the U.S. is an Arctic state and we cooperate very closely in the Arctic Council. From Russia's side, um, the motives are, are different. And the interesting thing is that um, I think they, they can both find a way of cooperation as long as uh, they do not uh, enter into a very strong competition uh, with the U.S. on the other hand. So all of this uh, is something that also, uh, of course, has implications on how we are thinking. Uh, and so far, we see that, um, as I said, this is a low tension area with some changes uh, coming potentially. Uh, but also, um, we, we see that, as I've said also several times before, that this is an area where we do not expect any potential conflicts to start, but we are concerned about the potential spillover effect, as you mentioned in your uh, introduction. Excellent. Uh, you mentioned China, uh, and uh, you just recently had a visit from the Chinese foreign minister. Could you share with us some perspectives on, uh, on? Uh, of course, you probably not disclose the full content of the, that conversation, but maybe you can share some perspective. Did you touch upon the Arctic or did you get the better ideas of what the Chinese interests are in the Arctic? And did you also discuss issues related to the China-Russia dimension that you touched upon? Well, we didn't discuss Arctic uh, now, but we did the last time we met in December, uh, because in November last year, we uh, restarted our uh, bilateral dialogue on Arctic issues. And that is, of course, because China has a great interest in the Arctic. Um, their presence, however, is, is I would say, not as, as strong as many can uh, get the impression of. I mean, it's, it's very easy to think that China is present all over in the Arctic, which they are not. Uh, and we have been very clear alongside the other Arctic states that um, 
China and others who want to engage, they have to do it within the framework of the context that already applies in the Arctic. For us, that is essential. It is really basic, uh, and and we want to, of course, convey that message to everyone who has an has an interest. And mm. um, we are, of course, um, looking into um, what kind of uh, implications, for instance, a stronger military cooperation between China and Russia can potentially have. So far, there are no indications that that will be a very, uh, I would say, uh, a strong and permanent uh, cooperation, but we could see exercises. We have also seen that there are some intelligence cooperation, but I think that basically there is also between Russia and China some sort of lack of, of trust in each other, meaning that you would not go um, much deeper uh, in a cooperation, maybe uh, broader to some, uh, some new areas, but not much deeper. Uh, you mentioned uh, exercises, and uh, just these days, uh, the US, the UK, and Norway conducting a military exercise uh, that is pretty close or even into, I think, uh, Russian economic zone. And uh, I think also just uh, some days ago, Russia had the exercise very close to the shores of Alaska that surprised some of the fishermen. Mike Sprague, I think, one of the panelists later on will, will bring that up. So, so there's this uh, increased number of exercises and they, they might be bigger and there is a bit of a risk of miscommunication and misunderstandings around this. And so, so what, how do you, what's your perspective on the, the extent of exercising? What are the, uh, do we have proper rules and uh, do, do the actors comply with the rules regarding uh, exercising and, uh, and transparency? Well, I think first and foremost, uh, it's important to understand in this context that the Russian exercises have over the past years become more complex. They um, they fly with more different flights. They are more present and, and also have exercise patterns and mobility that is very different compared to, for instance, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And from our side, we are very clear on the consequences of our NATO membership, which is well known to the Russians, uh, and they have known this uh, for decades now. And that also means allied um, exercises and, and also training. That has been uh, a part of Norwegian security and foreign policy uh, for decades, and it will continue to be so. So the fact that we are exercising together with allies is no new thing. Um, it will continue, and we always strive to find the balance between uh, defense and deterrence. We need to strive to find the balance also in everything from um, talking about these exercises. So they are, we are very open about the exercise activity that we do alone or with allies. Uh, we had extensive uh, information to the Russian side before uh, Trident Juncture uh, in 2018. Uh, that was also for us extremely important to, to be open about. We have, even though uh, we do not have a military cooperation with Russia, we have kept our channels of communications between the Northern Fleet and our operational headquarters open. So it is a regular contact there. And the point is exactly as you mentioned, to avoid misunderstanding, miscalculation, and also reduce the risk. Mm. So the fact that we are um, exercising uh, in our areas to also, of course, exercise what um, what the um, collective security guarantee is all about. It's just natural. Uh, the Russians are well used to that, and we have also increased our situational awareness in the area. But what I would like to add is, I, I just came yesterday evening from um, Tallinn, from a Nordic-Baltic uh, meeting of foreign ministers, which is my <laughs> only my second foreign trip since March. So uh, it's quite exotic to, to go to Tallinn nowadays. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to mention that there is a a lot of um, uneasiness about Russian activity in the Baltic Sea nowadays. And it was um, a big issue a couple of weeks ago that also led to a very prompt Swedish response. So this was also on our agenda when we talked about how the military posture uh, in our close areas are at the moment. And even though we don't do not see Russian military activity as directed towards Norway, we see the strategic challenge it poses for, for NATO. and. I mean, if Russia, if they deploy their bastion defense concept, 
then we will be uh, behind uh, Russian lines, which is, of course, a big, big challenge for, for Norway. Mm. You, uh, you mentioned several times this uh, idea that um, maybe one of the biggest threats for the Arctic is that um, tensions elsewhere might spill over to the Arctic. And obviously, uh, the Baltic Sea is one such, although it's very close, but you can also imagine as well. So then the question is, what kind of governance regime, what kind of communication uh, do Norway see as particularly important in order to prevent those tensions spilling over that region? Do you see that the Arctic have sufficient, let's say, buffering capacity? To, to ensure that those tensions that we see in the relationship between Russia and the West, in the relationship with China and the US and elsewhere, are spilling over to the Arctic. So do you, do you, is it your impression that, that the current structure of governance in the Arctic is sufficient somehow to, to, to have a conversation about these issues to prevent it and, and to have buff, sufficient buffering capacity? Well, I think that in the Arctic, there is one um, very, very important part of the governance structure, with, which is the Arctic Council. And even though the Arctic Council is not an area for security policy, I mean, we discuss almost everything else, it is still a format where we also build trust uh, among the Arctic states. And, and I think that's important to, to remember in this case, because you meet uh, and I meet when we talk about this, especially abroad, the idea that the Arctic is some sort of lawless area with no governance, with no structure, with no international law applying, whereas the reality is the, the opposite. Uh, and that also means that all the Arctic states are um, very, um, they, they are always um, abiding by international law. Uh, even the US, which has not ratified the law of the sea, uh, they are still abiding by the law of the sea, which is extremely important. We don't have any major territorial disputes and to the extent that you should have any uh, we have already agreed on how they are uh, to be solved mm -hmm. and, and and the fact that we also have a lot of people to people contact and and we have joint interests in so many uh, aspects that we that we actually conduct that is in itself a very good i would say assurance mm -hmm. then you have china uh, which is an observer to the arctic council um, and that has worked well um, as an observer state but I do think we have to um, prepare for that the big power rivalry, especially between the US and China, also will um, take up more space uh, in the Arctic discussion in the years to come. That does not mean that it will be any kind of conflict or anything, but I think that we have to prepare for that being a more prominent part of, of the discussion. So we do uh, what we can to keep everything from communication channels open to keeping a dialogue that is extremely important and, and using the governance structure that we have. And we always say to new actors, as I mentioned, that yes, uh, you are welcome to, uh, to engage in the Arctic, but you have to abide by the rules that are already there. Mm, excellent. Okay. Uh, we have received some excellent questions. Uh, so, thank you so much uh, to the audience. Uh, I think some of the questions have already been uh, covered uh, as we have been discussing uh, uh, in that. Uh, uh, but we have uh, time to pose a few, few more. Uh, and let me just read up a few of them, and then maybe you can pick which one you would like to start with. Maybe you have the time to cover all of them. Okay. And to the audience, let me also say that uh, please uh, send, uh, continue to send in uh, questions and then we will we'll try to find someone that we can address to you. First, some of the questions uh, relates to the consequences of great power rivalry and of course Arctic presence for Norway. And let me just run through three of them. The first is, will greater American or NATO military presence in Norway's Arctic affect how Russia views Norway? Will Norway be seen as a springboard for American security interests? So that's one question. And then a question about China. Uh, you have touched upon it, but China is expected to have a military presence in the Arctic in the near future. How will such a Chinese presence affect Norway, Norwegian security and stability in the region? Does China support a rules-based order in the Arctic? 
And then uh, thirdly, what can Norway do to contribute to a nuclear strategic to, to nuclear strategic stability in the Arctic? Uh, I, I just suggest that we start there if you would like to address some of this. So first is American, greater American military pressure uh, presence and how that might affect Russia's view of Norway. Well, um, thank you to uh, to the listeners and viewers and participants for, for good questions. Um, I think we sometimes forget that the American and allied presence uh, during the Cold War was much, much bigger than it is today. Um, we have exercises jointly, which we have wanted because we have wanted to see our armed forces more integrated uh, in exercises with our allies, meaning that um, if we have a situation, and we do not expect such a situation to occur, but if it happens, then the content and the value of Article 5 and our security guarantee is our ability to operate together. So, so we put a lot of emphasis on that, and we've been doing that for the past years. And we have asked for, as European allies, uh, greater American engagement and presence. And we have seen that over the last years, which we have been happy to see. But we do this uh, within the framework that has always existed. Uh, we, um, this is a part of our NATO membership. It is no surprise to the Russians. And we conduct uh, our everyday uh, presence and our sovereignty uh, and our exercise of, of power from Norway's side. I mean, we, we fly, we sail, we do all the things that is normal for a country to do. And that is also an activity that is, that is known uh, to, uh, to Russia. So we um, do not expect that to affect how Russia is thinking, because much of the increased um, increased activity uh, from the U.S. side and from Allies side uh, in the North Atlantic, for instance, is also a direct response of the buildup on the Russian side. But from our side, we see this as a very natural part of the alliance and, and having our security guarantees as part of uh, as part of the alliance. We have to train and exercise in peacetime to be ready for something eventually to happen that we do not expect and do not hope to happen. Hmm. On China and the military presence, um, well, China is uh, talking a lot about um, the international rules-based world order, uh, the multilateral framework. Um, and of course, we uh, expect China to abide by it, but we also have to be aware that China is also wanting to shape multilateralism and international rules-based order in their own interests and, and their own picture. And we see that in many aspects in the UN, for instance, where uh, something as, uh, well, it could sound quite boring, but change of language is one of the things that we are, uh, together with others, uh, looking into whether that is kind of changing the balance in, in some of this uh, cooperation. Uh, again, we have to, uh, I mean, our very clear precondition for engagement, not only from China, but also from other actors, is to abide by international law that already exists. Um, and that also means that uh, when we um, see increased engagement from China in the Arctic, those are the rules and we're not the only ones saying that that also goes for the other uh, arctic states uh, that says exactly the same mm. uh, on nuclear strategic stability in the arctic well um i think it's it's important to underline that right now one of our biggest concerns is that the nuclear um, regime and the uh, disarmament regime is under so much pressure. Uh, we are putting a lot of emphasis on verification and working together with the US, UK and Sweden on verification issues in, in the UN. That is, I think, the only, um, the only area right now uh, in this regard who has some progress, which is not as polarized as many of the others. But we are concerned about for instance, new start, uh, whether or not it will be prolonged and renewed. We are concerned about uh, the non-proliferation treaty and the fact that we should have had a, a 50 years conference uh, this spring that, of course, was, was postponed because of COVID. But we have to continue to work on, on these issues. We are, of course, very concerned that the INF treaty is now effectively over. Uh, we have also encouraged China to say yes to the invitation from the U.S. side to be part of these um, nuclear disarmament regimes. And, and we are 
concerned about the fact that this is an area that is so polarized internationally that talking about these things uh, is, is even difficult for many countries. So, so we continue to push that ag agenda and think that is maybe one of the most important things that we can do in, in addition to continuing our cooperation on nuclear safety and security with, the, uh, with Russia. Okay, excellent. Uh, uh, we, we have this talked quite a bit about the US and China and Russia. Let me just let us also say a few words about Europe and the European uh, countries uh, and, and of course the EU itself. Um, the EU and we have some questions related to that. Uh, the first is uh, the EU have a public consultation on the Arctic strategy going on right now. Um, and do you see any new challenges or potential for cooperation, I might add? in uh, in relation to this new EU strategy? So that's the first question. And then secondly, uh, uh, are, do you see any Russian or EU policies that can be problematic for Norway's exercise of sovereignty on Svalbard? There's a question related to that. Uh, this year also marks the, and this is no question, but this is from me. So, the, so this is also a kind of anniversary for the Svalbard Treaty as well, of course. So maybe you could say a few words about that as well. well so there's two questions: the EU's Arctic strategy, and then uh, the Svalbard and and the issues related to that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I only have a few minutes left. I can see, so I will yeah. try to make it very very quick. Um, on, on the EU strategy, I think um, it's fair to say that we are working together with, uh, for instance, uh, Finland, Sweden and Denmark also to make sure that um, Arctic issues are perceived as I mentioned in my uh, in the beginning or in the introduction that this is not an area where international law does not apply because we see tendencies in some European countries who are geographically far away from uh, from the north that they tend to perceive this as an area where there is a huge fight for resources, where, where it's a, like, a, like a no man's land, which of course is not the case. And I always argue when I meet my European colleagues and others that, first of all, we have 9% of our population living north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, that is more than almost any other Arctic country. We have some of the world's leading uh, innovation uh, communities, we have universities, we have uh, research and also industry and businesses that are thriving uh, in the north and we have a lot of our resources uh, in the north. So, so for us this is not only a, a discussion of, for instance, a, um, an issue of whether you should uh, try to, or to find at least the right balance between protection and production. And that is one of the challenges, or I would say two of the challenges, to, to get the understanding around that this is really not a deserted area where you only see ice and polar bears. This is where people live and this is where we uh, get some of our, our values from, much of our values. Secondly, uh, in, in our mind, we have been able to strike that balance uh, between a very sensible and, and also sustainable management of resources over decades often together with other Arctic states like Russia. Uh, so to protect everything and not make use of the resources is not an option for us. But that is a thought that we see many places in, in European countries that are, I would say, very... Uh, many countries tend to have that uh, angle into discussing the Arctic. So we have, we have work uh, cut out for us in discussing that, but we have good partners and, and we see that there's a lot of understanding uh, for our perspective as well. So when it comes to uh, Svalbard, uh, first and foremost, I think it's important to underline that Norwegian sovereignty over Svalbard is undisputed. And I also always underline that it is important that the rules and regulations that apply on Svalbard, they apply to everyone. Uh, it's a very, very vulnerable environment in Svalbard, which means that we have certain specific preconditions that apply to, to everyone. And we see that there is a tendency or a willingness uh, of some kind, especially on the Russian side, to sometimes either bilateralize uh, discussions, uh, like um, Sergei Lavrov wrote in a letter to me in February, where they want consultations on Svalbard. Uh, we have been equally clear back. This is not a new Russian point of view. 
and they also got our very familiar Norwegian point of view. But of course, we do not consult with other countries on any part of Norwegian territory, neither do any other country. Uh, and that, of course, also goes for Svalbard, which is a part of Norway, a natural part of Norway. So for us, this is also about making sure that the provisions in the Svalbard Treaty are well known and also that Norwegian laws and regulations that are completely in line with the Svalbard Treaty are also well known. And uh, on a daily basis, this works well. We have a good cooperation with Russia in Svalbard. Uh, and we, we absolutely see that rules and regulations are abided by, and we want to keep it that way. Hmm. Okay, excellent. I see time, uh, time is running, so we might uh, probably have to uh, come to an end now. Uh, but it was also very good uh, somehow to hear the, the loud and clear <laughs> voices and expressions uh, related to to Norway's interest also in the Arctic, apart from not only talking about the, the geopolitical uh, other great powers' uh, interest in the Arctic. It's obvious that that uh, for Norway this is this is also of course of critical importance, and we have our own interests to 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 take into account. So uh, uh, I would just like to uh, see since you are busy and we have to uh, stick to our schedule. I think that we have to say thank you so much, uh, Foreign Minister, for joining us uh, this morning to kicking off the conference, and you contributed in a great way. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, and uh, I wish you a very fruitful and good conference. Uh, I saw the program, and I, um, in a way, I wish I could be just a silent participant for the rest of the day. <laughs> Unfortunately, I cannot. So I wish you all the best for the conference, and thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, although the foreign minister cannot uh, join in for the rest of the day, the, the rest of you can. Hopefully, so so and so. Please stay tuned, and the next session will be on Russia in the Arctic. Uh, you should. Uh, I think that you can uh, click on uh, uh, register for that event either by visiting Nupi's uh, ho uh, homepage or event page, or looking into your the email you you received when you registered for this conference. So so stay tuned. Thank you so much to the foreign minister, and, and uh, uh, wish you all a good conference. Thank you.